Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. What if I told you that once a year, there is a festival somewhere in the mountains of New Hampshire, far away from any type of government body. And at this festival, People can truly be free from the oppression of government. They can carry their own guns. They can do whatever they want to do. They can sell food. They can really experiment with this anarcho-capitalist lifestyle. This festival exists, and it's called the Porcupine Festival that takes place in New Hampshire every year. It was at this festival in 2012 that I met my guest today, George Mandrick. You may never heard of Mandrick, but Mandrick has heard of you. He was one of the first employees of a lot of different crypto companies, myself included. He was the head of customer support at BitInstant, and he was one of the first employees at blockchain.info. Mandrick talks about how he made his living on Bitcoin at this festival selling baklava back in 2012, where there were some wild parties and things went on at this event that we actually probably can't talk about. But it was at this event where I met Mandrick, I actually met Roger Veer, Eric Voorhees, and so many other crypto people that came through this space. Jeffrey Tucker, everyone was at this event going back in 2012. Mandrick and I talk about his life at an instant, his first experience with ASIC mining and how he had to turn off the heater because it was too hot. The miner, he turned it off. It was so cool. After I closed my company, Mandrick moved to blockchain.com and he gives his thoughts on closing the coin mixing service that they had in the early days. You don't want to miss this episode. There are so many good stories, so many people that Mandrick met along the way, and I really loved and enjoyed doing this episode. I'll talk to you guys right after the ads. How do you actually live your life on crypto? How do you do it? I've been doing it since I first got started with Bitcoin back in, what, like 2011. But since 2016, I've been using the BitPay debit card to spend my Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis. And it's been such a great product that I've been using it for over three years. BitPay is now sponsoring Untold Stories, and they're going to be giving away free Visa debit cards to all my listeners. All you have to do is visit bitpay.com forward slash Charlie. It's such an easy card to use. You get the card in the mail, you download the BitPay app, you put Bitcoin on the app, and when you want to send Bitcoin from the app into your debit card, it only takes a few seconds and you can spend your Bitcoin anywhere credit cards are offered. It's really so easy. You almost wonder, like, why didn't this come out in 2011 when Bitcoin first launched? Well, it was very difficult to do. In fact, I actually tried to launch my own debit card, but I wasn't able to because the credit card companies were very reluctant to do it. But now BitPay launched their product and a lot of other companies have launched credit cards and debit cards using Bitcoin over the years. I still will only use the BitPay card. I'm very loyal to the brands I like um, and I hope you guys are too. The fees are very low. You can use it to withdraw cash at ATMs. You can use it all around the world with very, very low fees. A lot of companies have tacked on like super high fees, and I don't like that. So check it out, bitpay.com forward slash Charlie. That's bitpay.com forward slash Charlie. You get a free card. You don't have to pay for it. Usually the card costs like 10 bucks or more. There's a commitment, but you don't have to do that here. It's a free card. There's literally no reason to not try it out. I've been using it for over three years. So check it out. I'm super excited to share that we're now working with BitPanda here at Untold Stories. BitPanda is the leading European platform for investing in digital assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Their core product is an easy-to-use crypto on-ramp and digital asset broker with over a million users. How cool is that? You can not only trade crypto like Bitcoin and Ether, but you can also trade digitized gold and around 30 other digital assets. What's amazing about BitPanda is how easy it is to set up an account within minutes and get going with the minimum amount of just one euro. So make sure you check out BitPanda. They are a sponsor of Untold Stories. I love them, especially if you're in Europe or anywhere in the world. BitPanda.com. Thank you so much, guys. 
Over the years, a lot of companies have tried doing crypto social networking. But the problem is that there are a lot of really good social networking apps already out there like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. How do we build a social network that's perfect for crypto? Well, I want to talk about Pepo, our newest sponsor of Untold Stories. Pepo is an amazing social media app that's built for the crypto community. What's really cool about it is that you can get rewarded for uploading and putting out good content, and you can also reward with crypto people who put up content that you really, really like. It's fast and simple, and it's the first crypto-powered app to be approved by the Apple and Google app stores. You can find me on Pepo right now at Charlie Shrem, the same handle as my Twitter, and I'm going to be posting interviews, travel videos, and more. So make sure you check out Pepo. It's super cool. Pepo.com. Enjoy it. Untold Stories wouldn't be here without the amazing production company, Blockworks Group. A few months ago, I approached Blockworks Group and I said, hey guys, I want to do a show, Untold Stories. Can we make it happen? And these guys are the only event and podcast production company that I trust. Really, the show is powered by them and it wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of the Blockworks Group team. So for access to all the premier digital asset conferences and to check out their other podcasts in their network that they produce, check them out at blockworksgroup.io. That's blockworksgroup.io. I promise you will not be disappointed. This show consists of some amazing people that we've already spent so much time with talking and hearing their story and how they came to have been building and growing this whole industry. What's interesting is that a lot of the guests you've never actually heard of. And I've had people message me after and say, wow, I had no idea who this person was, how they did this, and why they were so important. My next guest is known by Mandrick. Mandrick is very interesting because he actually has been running the customer support departments for some of the largest companies in the crypto space, including my company, BitInstant, from 2011 to 2013, and virtually was one of the first employees at blockchain.info that now has hundreds of employees. Mandrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Charlie. It's good to be here. And I'm glad nobody knows who I am. Let's let's try to keep it that way, okay? No, that's that's the best part. That's the best part when no one knows who you are. Um, my 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 question that I've always wanted to ask you is how do you have the patience to de- dealing with people? Uh, you know, I I guess it's just been my whole life. Uh I grew up in the restaurant industry. My my family my family's Greek, so of course they own restaurants. You know what else would they do when they came over on a boat? That's very <laughs> stereotypical for you to say, by the way. It's stereotypical because it's true. At least with my family, I mean, they <laughs> came over. My family's first generation. My mom and dad. So, or you know, they they were born in Greece. Um, so I guess I'm first generation American. But uh, you know, my they did they they opened restaurants. I started working at my dad's when I was 11, but I grew up in it all my life. So I was always around people and food and. And it was just, it was, it was my life for the longest time. You have like patience working at a restaurant because you have to deal with, you know, the customer is always right. Uh, I didn't have any patience really until into my twenties, I guess, <laughs> but yeah, I was in the kitchen for the most part. It's easier to be impatient when you're a cook and you don't have to interact, but I did eventually start working out more on the floor and things like that. And I think the more I spent in a restaurant, the more I realized I didn't want to be in a restaurant. Where do you need to have more patients in, in the crypto space or in the restaurant business? Oh, definitely in the restaurant business, I think. Really? For the most part, as far as like customer service is concerned. Because yeah. in the crypto space, I was doing I was doing email support. Email support is, you, you, you can get frustrated, but it's not like the customer is going to see that firsthand. So uh, I think I think responding, it's a, it's a lot more chill. I mean, it can get frustrating when things are very busy, but uh, face-to-face interactions in a hot kitchen <laughs> that that could be uh, way more stressful. Sitting at home in the AC, you kind of you kind of think back when you have a really bad day in the crypto space. I just think back to those really bad days at the restaurant, and I'm like, this is this is nothing. <laughs> so you got into Bitcoin around 2011 or 2012, I guess. 2011. And, it was like late 2011. Yeah. And you your first foray into the space was selling a baklava for Bitcoin. Yeah, so I guess I guess it really started with the whole the whole Bitcoin journey. I think started with the Ron Paul run back in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, when he ran for president. It was kind of like an eye opening time for me. That Ron as... Paul run was how a lot of people 
you know, that the Ron Paul run coupled with Free Talk Live yep. and Mark Edge and, and the overlap of both was really what pushed a lot of people into Bitcoin, including yourself, myself, Roger Veer, Eric Voorhees, all got in from that original movement. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy when you think back to it. I mean, so many of us came from that time. I mean, I think Ron Paul woke a lot of us up back in 2007 when he when he was up there on the stage talking about ending, you know, closing down military bases overseas and and you know, not not going on all the to all these wars and everything. It was just like, "What? This is a Republican? What is this? I thought these guys were, you know, war hawks or whatever." And uh, well, how did that translate into Bitcoin then? I, I I mean, really from there it was just as as I as I got more and more down the rabbit hole of the liberty movement. I, I found Free Talk Live, which is, you know, a very uh, freedom-oriented talk show that, that's just on all the time. They're, they're based in New Hampshire. And uh, I think... Uh, they're literally every night from like 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Yeah, and it's a it's a great show. I mean, I haven't listened in years. I, I co-hosted it a couple times as a guest. It was fun. But uh, but it's kind of like... It's it's a really cool show. It's, it's just... It's good. I, I would definitely recommend listening to it if you have never heard it before. Because I don't know how many people still. Yeah, I'm sure they still get, have a big audience. Uh, but yeah, so so from there, I think I think Gavin Andreessen went on the show in early 2011 to talk oh, about wow. Bitcoin, and he like he reached out to those guys and he was like, "Hey, I want to talk to you guys about Bitcoin," and they're like, "Yeah, sure, whatever." And I think he drove up to New Hampshire from Massachusetts where he lives, and he and he talked about Bitcoin. And then I don't think they really did anything with that. I'm I'm pretty sure Roger Veer talks about that's how he heard about it and that's how he got into it from Free Talk Live. It's true. And Eric. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Eric Voorhees. Yeah. Uh, so I think from there, a lot of us still, we weren't sold on it. Like in, in 2011, I had moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project, which was, which is, which is an organization whose goal is to move like 20,000 liberty minded people to New Hampshire. I, I don't live there anymore, but I'd spent a few years there. And it was kind of the perfect storm because a lot of us were living up there. We were doing uh, counter economical things like agorism which is which is what i was doing where you know you're just selling food selling selling products to people without state intervention we're choosing to conduct business without asking for permission like in the form of licensing or anything like that and that's really easy to do when you're not making much money you know you're not going to get on the government's radar <laughs> when you True don't really, story. <laughs> when you're poor i guess but uh but i mean it's still it still felt good, good i guess that's a good point <laughs> that's a good point that i never really made before is that um in the libertarian movement, you could do whatever you want, but once you start making real money and affecting like a lot of people, yeah. that's when you'll start to get on the radar. So I mean, so let's 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 talk about Porkfest. So you so you moved you moved to um to New Hampshire, which was a which was a big deal. And so for my listeners, there's this movement called the Free State Project. And the Free State Project's mantra is basically Let's get as many free thinking, liberty minded people, you know, not specifically the term libertarian, but just right. liberty minded people to all move to New Hampshire. And then eventually, because we'll all be living together, we'll all be able to have the voting block. We can vote our representatives into local and state governments, which which has been happening. New Hampshire is the most free state, I think, in all the states. I mean, don't tread on me is their state flag. Yeah. Um, so it has been very successful. Um, you know, like the the um they're very protective of the Second Amendment for your guns. Absolutely. Um, in terms of regulations and taxes, it's it's been very free. Um so everyone moved there. Bruce Fenton lives there now as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of people move there. And that's that's the concept. And so when I had first met Eric in the end of 2011, early 2012, I didn't really know much of the libertarian movement at all. I was just this kid from Brooklyn. And so he he was telling me, he's like, yeah. And so here uh, it's like August. He's like, hey, what are you doing next week? And I was like, well, nothing. I don't think it's like August. And he said, well, you know, a bunch of us are going to New Hampshire to, to camp out for two weeks. And I was like, oh, well, who's going? He's like, well, there's a few thousand people who are all going to be carrying guns, doing a lot of drugs, eating a bunch of food, even though there's no restaurants. And it's just gonna be a lot of fun. I was like, fuck it. Count me in. I'm in. <laughs> so we, we drove up to Pork Fest. And the Porcupine Festival. And that's where I actually, I think I met you for the first time there. Yeah, I doubt, um, I doubt we talked much because I... We didn't really talk because so I was buying, I was buying bacon woos from you. Yeah, so I had, I had, uh, me and my buddy, Jay, we, we ran a food stand there every year. I, uh, I mean, I was selling, I, I was selling baklava online. That's really, I was doing that 
since 2019. That was my form of agorism. That was my form of activism where it's like, I'm going to sell this. I'm going to sell this out of my house, you know, without licensing or whatever. And, you know, it wasn't like it was paying all the bills, but it was like a nice little side job. I'd already learned how to make baklava as a kid. And it's something that I think I can make pretty well, even though I don't eat it, but I, I do sell it. Uh, or dead anyways. So yeah, you don't was, eat it anymore. No, no. I've been doing. I've been doing low carb, paleo, keto, keto thing. Basically, basically I mean yeah. carnivore more or less now. But uh, for the past eight years, really around the same time I got into Bitcoin. But yeah, so like we, I talked to a buddy. Uh, we decided to start running a food stand at Pork Fest, which was insane because it's up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. There's nothing around. You have to bring everything you need up there. Uh, I mean, like the closest resupply is like an hour away. Like what? What did you, what did you have to bring? Tell me about that. Well, as it as first it started, we just had some basic equipment. We had a small menu. Uh, we were selling like euros. Um, uh, I guess like some some breakfasty items. The baklava. We were deep frying baklava. We were doing all kinds of just whatever experimental stuff. The, the first year we did it was 2010, and we had a small we had a small um, booth with like this little griddle we picked up at a Cabela's. This little propane griddle, uh, and we were using that. But as the years went on, like by 2012, 2013, we were basically running restaurant equipment and running it and setting it up in uh, a big pavilion at this campsite. I mean, it's a campsite. It's not equipped to, to run a restaurant, but we just were running, you know, like a giant truck and bringing tons of stuff, tons of food, just so much, so much stuff. Uh, my back hurts just thinking about moving all that again. Uh, and yeah, we were running a restaurant and we started getting crazy with stuff where we're, we started making uh, bacon weave sandwiches. I would take like 10 pieces of bacon, weave it five by five grid. And uh, we would do it like as a low carb option, instead of uh, a gyro with pita bread, we'd take out the pita bread and add the bacon weave. We called it a train wreck, sold it for 10 bucks. And it was huge. I mean, we what's would, a train wreck again? The train wreck was, you know, you take like the gyro, the gyro, where you have like the pita bread, the, the meat, salt, you know, tzatziki sauce, tomato, onion. You just, get rid of the pita bread and you put the bacon weave there instead. And then it's like, what's boom, a bacon weave? low carb option. What's a bacon weave? I know what a bacon weave is, but I it's, want my listeners to, to salivate over what, just, what it is. It's just bacon. <laughs> it's just this, this layer of it's bacon. It's not just bacon. No, it's not just bacon. <laughs> I mean, I would sit there, I would sit there and hand weave all this bacon into like a little net, you know, 10 pieces each weave. Like grandma, I'm not knitting. I'm <laughs> weaving bacon. <laughs> and I mean, we would buy to prep this. We would buy about, it's a couple hundred pounds of bacon and we're doing this in our house. Me and my buddy, we're prepping these weaves. So we would kind of like half cook them and then individually wrap them and freeze them. So that way, when we got to pork fest, all we had to do is unwrap them, throw them on this griddle to, to, to reheat it, essentially finish cooking off the pro finish the cooking process for the bacon and then make the sandwich. And, uh, it was a huge hit. I mean, it was insane. We would really? run out of those so fast. Um, uh, and it was fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun to do. And I, and it's kind of funny. I mean, that's how I met, that's how I met you. That's how I met pretty much everybody uh, in the early days of Bitcoin was through, I have was through cooking. Two questions for you. Yeah. Um, is it correctly pronounced Euro or Gyro? It's, it's Euro. Okay. But I say, so I still say Gyro because where did whatever. the G, well, it's, it's easier to say, but where did the G come from? There's no, I, there's no like G sound like, like J in the Greek language. It's more like a Y. So, but that's like that's, this, yeah. So that just people say gyro because gyro is not really that's not really a sound I guess in the English language as much. In it Hebrew, is, but... the same the same sandwich basically the same like literally the same ingredients, mm -hmm. but instead of tzatziki, you put uh, tchina or hummus. Okay. And the same sandwich is called a lafa. Yeah, that sounds good with tahini. Oh, it's so much better. <laughs> like I love tzatziki sauce, but um, you put like sh shaved shawarma. In a, in, wrapped in a lafa, like the gyro, same thing with the, with the gyro. So it's the same type of bread, like that thin, yeah. but larger wrap, you know, pita. Yep. And you put it in with, um, you put like, you know, tahina, like sabich, which is like a hot sauce, and a bunch, of, and then like onions, peppers, and then it's not lamb meat. Well, it could be lamb meat, but it's, you ever see those, sh like the, the, the big blocks of meat that are like on a rotisserie, but instead of going like, like a wheel, like it's, it's on, it's on its side and it mm -hmm. spins sideways and yeah. the guy has a big knife and he shaves it off. Yeah. That's the type of meat. 
Yeah, and uh, but it's uh, the same Mediterranean. It's a, it comes from the same place. I think it's Medi- you know Mediterranean Greek, yeah, Turkish, I, Israeli. A lot of that meat too. Uh, this is kind of off a tangent, but I don't even call it meat anymore. It's my because, show, I do whatever I want. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even really consider it meat. A lot of because like a lot of people. I've talked to some of the, the people who eat like a carnivore diet and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to get some shawarma. And I'm like, don't get it, dude. Cause it's all held together by like wheat essentially. Oh, is it really? <laughs> oh yeah. There's nothing like, in hindsight. When I look back, I'm like, oh man, I used to eat this stuff. This is, this is just like garbage meat. Cause it's like, I think about it, how is, how are you getting this delicious tasting meat to hold together on the spit? You look at it and you're like, what is that? Like what part of meat is that? Yeah. <laughs> What part of meat is that? You know what I mean? Like, so how, is your, that, how is that possible? So it's like 2011, 2012, you're weaving bacon in this anarchist utopia yeah. in the White Mountains of New Hampshire where people paying you in dollars? Yeah, so I mean, it was the perfect storm for Bitcoin because at the time, in 2011, at least Porkfest 2011, that summer. Porkfest was the perfect storm, as you say, because at the time, the time that it was, um, Bitcoin was really starting to gain some traction. And I think Porkfest was like one of the first, one of the earlier manifestations of people actually being able to like, not just talk about Bitcoin, but, but use Bitcoin, um, in a re- in real life scenarios. Yeah. I think, uh, the 20, that summer of 2012, when it really took off with Bitcoin in New Hampshire and it was the perfect storm because the price we were in a bear market at the time, I don't know if people remember or not, but the price was like five bucks. So it was easy for anybody to use the time as far as like to like obtain and use it then. And the narrative at the time was that it was fast, free and anonymous, which I think we've we've learned a lot since then. But that's kind of what we were sold on early on by a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, early users. And that's what we thought. And it and it and it did work for that at that time because gold and silver just it was just unwieldy. And a lot of us in Porkfest were just looking for ways to get around government fiat. and. Uh, you know, over time, like I said, over time, I think we learned that Bitcoin isn't as fast and or free, and it's definitely not anonymous, uh, being pseudo anonymous. And I think that just took time with using it for us to realize that. But it still is a great way to bypass government money. It's still perfect for that. Well, it was what it became. I feel like is the evolution of of what it was, and um, obviously, with more people using something, the original properties can't remain, and things evolve and change. But I agree with you. So for the listeners, try to picture this. Here's this event called the Porcupine Festival. And the Porcupine Festival has been going on for who knows how long. Um, probably a decade, more than that, Magic. I, I believe the first Porcupine Freedom Festival was 2007 or 8. I, maybe okay. even earlier. So you I, have, I I'm honestly not sure. So you have basically um, 2,000 plus people that are living in the White Mountains for a week, week and a half. And here you have there's it's as if there's no government there. So it's 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 in this huge, huge, huge campgrounds where the owner of the campgrounds is like, you do you you know, live and let live. You guys have this for the for the for the week. And it pretty much is just con- it's there's people with RVs camping out Um, there's a little like hotel in type place. And <clears throat> the, the community that's there essentially builds out a little village, a little town. And so there, uh, there's this one main road. It's like a dirt path. And then around the dirt path is where everyone lives. And then in that dirt path, that road, that up and down north south road on both sides of the road to like a main street, people are sell, people are selling their wares and anyone can sell anything. You can, you could make food. You could, um, and, um, sell whatever goods you want and whatever is being sold is enough to sustain you. So you can literally show up at pork fest with a tent. And as long as you have money, you can live. So there's food. Uh, Mandrick was doing food. Um, there was a guy um, who would make <clears throat> who would make um, like these Louisiana shrimp po' boys that were amazing. There was one couple that did breakfast. There was one guy that did ice cream. There was all these different. There was one this one company, Magic. Do you remember uh, Gulch Gulch or whatever they were called? They were kicked out actually. Yeah, yeah they were. <clears throat> they were. They had a chainsaw and they were let, setting it off at like you know like. At like uh, two in the morning. But so it was the community that yeah, yeah. the community that kind of voted it to kick them out in a way because they were being so loud and obnoxious. And there's that whole question like, who will police the community? Who will build the roads? You know, well, here yeah. you have a situation where it got so bad, the community hated it that they were asked to leave. 
and they left. I think there there was a lot of there was a lot of infighting with that kind of thing. But yeah, but there, it, I think that did come down to that. I think ultimately the Free State Project made the decision because it is their event. Sure. But but for the most part, yeah, I mean it is that way, and people were selling alcohol. Yeah. And even the local PD drives through the RV site regularly, and they would just see people doing all these things, and they would just leave them alone because they're they were like, I'm like, we're not getting. People involved. were walking around with guns on their holsters. They were walking around with joints in their mouth. They were drinking. Yep. It was just like a free movement. And I don't know if I can do that for more than a week, but it was fun to see. Um, what was really more interesting was how people transacted at the, at the Porcupine Festival. Um, and I, what, I, what I saw in 2012 was the first um, iteration of people using Bitcoin. So there was, there, was a, there was an overlap. So people were still using silver. And so I, that's when I, at that Porcupine Festival is where I learned about the term FRNs, Federal Reserve Notes. But they call them, they don't call them dollars. They call them FRNs as like a negative term. Right. And so yeah, people were using FRNs and silver to transact, but you, it, silver is very difficult to transact with. It, it is. It's not, it's not the easiest. And if you get into silver and you get into gold, you start to recognize that certain rounds have more, more value than others, even if they have the same ounce. Like, you know, it could be a one ounce, one, one ounce round is not created equally because some have more numismatic value than others. And I'm not just talking about collector's rounds, but there's just specific rounds that are like, just more sought after and you can get more money for them on eBay. So you got to deal with like one ounce of silver is not one ounce of silver necessarily. Like it's not necessarily. Spot. Well, how do you make change? Uh, either uh, like, let's say I had, I'd have some guy who'd come in at the beginning of the week and buy a sandwich and give me a 10th of an ounce of gold. And then I just basically have a tab for him where it's like, he has like credit. Uh, that's how that would work with gold with silver. Sometimes we'd give him change in dollars. Sometimes we'd give him change in, smaller silver rounds because we'd have you know one tenth ounce it was just a lot of just like mental gymnastics trying to figure out this all out but we but we made it work i mean that's the thing we did make it work the easiest thing at the time people had cassatious rounds and those were the first physical bitcoins uh and they were flowing like crazy i mean roger veer had rolls of them and he was paying for everybody with them and i mean of course now they're rare collectibles but at the time it was a it was basically a five dollar coin yeah, I remember, and we had Mike Caldwell on this show in the episodes. Um, I'm not sure it depends if it if it was released yet, but we had him on the show, and we talked about that how that was like the first time people were able to create these physical um, things out of Bitcoin, and that was very interesting. It was, and it worked really well at the time. Uh, I think in hindsight, yeah, maybe those rounds aren't as secure. There's a lot of problems with the whole idea of just a sticker, and I think if you're looking for they're a collector's solution, items. Right. At this point, they're collector's items. Something more functional would be like an open dime for today. That would give you the security. And, you know, so it, it's a better solution for that. But yeah. By this time, you have you weren't working in the space. There was not really a space to really work in. There, were, there weren't really companies. I was running BitInstant out of like my basement with Eric. There was no um, there weren't really many besides for BitPay and Mt. Gox. There weren't really any companies in the space to actually work with it was all like fledgling experiments what changed after that event for you i I think after that event i just realized the the cooking i I enjoy cooking but just cooking for in mass and just over it just takes a toll on your body and there was just other things i was doing around new hampshire uh i mean anything i could find i was cleaning houses i was doing whatever i could just to you know, make ends meet. Really, bigger thing. Oh yeah, I was just I was doing whatever I could, man. At the time, I'd go to events and cook. Uh, I'd clean house. Yeah, like I said, I'd clean houses. There was all kinds of stuff, and and I didn't mind it. Like I, I liked it, and there was people paying me in Bitcoin. It was great because that's what the community was. The community was just. So you were working Bitcoin, so. within the 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 Bitcoin community, doing all these side hustles. You know what's interesting yeah. about you is that that's what most people did in the early space. Um, Cassatius coins was a side hustle for Mike. My first foray into Bitcoin was I was selling airline vouchers and other knickknacks that I can buy from warehouses on the Bitcoin forums for Bitcoin. Yeah, I think a lot of us just wanted to find a way to make Bitcoin our life, right? Like I reached the point where I'm like, I just want 100% of my income in Bitcoin. I just want to, this is what I love. It's my passion. And I just want to find a way to to make that into a profession, right? So it's just kind of like, what can I do? And you, we were just a lot of us were just kind of just figuring it out, right? And I think that's I think that's how I met you. 
uh, ultimately was through cooking. That's why I made a lot of connections was through a lot of these side hustles. And that just led to op- other opportunities. And, you know, maybe I didn't have as much experience into those other opportunities, but when you have that passion and you have that desire, you figure it out, you know, and it's not like fake it till you make it, but I mean, like you really dedicate yourself to, to doing as great a job as possible. I don't, I don't really like that term because it's almost like deceptive, but no, I see um, your point. I see your yeah, point. It, you just wanted like, to okay, do maybe, it. Yeah. I would just be honest. Like I might not be the best. It's going to take me a little bit of time to figure this out, but you know, I will, you know, I will figure it out and, you know, give me a month or two and we'll be killing it. You know, we'll be, I'll be doing a, going above and beyond with this work. How do you actually live your life on crypto? How do you do it? I've been doing it since I first got started with Bitcoin back in what, like 2011. But since 2016, I've been using the BitPay debit card to spend my Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis. And it's been such a great product that I've been using it for over three years. BitPay is now sponsoring Untold Stories, and they're going to be giving away free Visa debit cards to all my listeners. All you have to do is visit bitpay.com forward slash Charlie. It's such an easy card to use. You get the card in the mail, you download the BitPay app, you put Bitcoin on the app, and when you want to send Bitcoin from the app into your debit card, it only takes a few seconds and you can spend your Bitcoin anywhere credit cards are offered. It's really so easy. You almost wonder, like, why didn't this come out in 2011 when Bitcoin first launched? Well, it was very difficult to do. In fact, I actually tried to launch my own debit card, but I wasn't able to because the credit card companies were very reluctant to do it. But now BitPay launched their product and a lot of other companies have launched credit cards and debit cards using Bitcoin over the years. I still will only use the BitPay card. I'm very loyal to the brands I like. Um, And I hope you guys are too. The fees are very low. You can use it to withdraw cash at ATMs. You can use it all around the world with very, very low fees. A lot of companies have tacked on like super high fees and I don't like that. So check it out. BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. That's BitPay.com forward slash Charlie. You get a free card. You don't have to pay for it. Usually the card costs like 10 bucks or more. There's a commitment but you don't have to do that here. It's a free card. There's literally no reason to not try it out. I've been using it for over three years. So check it out. And thanks for listening to Untold Stories. All right. So I hope you didn't skip my ad because in the early part of the episode, we talked about how Bitpanda is working with us here at Untold Stories. Bitpanda is the leading European platform for investing in digital assets. I really like Bitpanda's approach. Why? I'll tell you why. So don't skip. Basically, what they're doing is to apply the same tech you're used to from Bitcoin to other digital assets. So, for example, you trade real precious metals like gold and silver on their platform 24-7 with ultra low fees. And what's really cool is that you can trade gold and silver and these other precious metals with other assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptos that they support. So in a nutshell... Bitpanda is advocating the tokenization topic, so they want to bring financial products like stocks, ETFs, and more to everybody who uses their platform anywhere in the world. So check them out, bitpanda.com, support my sponsors, have a great day. Over the years, I've learned a lot from crypto winters, a lot of the bull and bear markets, and there's a lot of things that I've learned. But one of the most important things that I've learned is that community is one of our strongest assets. It allows us to continue working together and talking to each other during the good times, the bad times, and hopefully not the ugly times. Over the past few months, I've been speaking with the Pepo team. These guys have spent years working with members of the crypto community and learning what we want in social sharing apps. And I'm really excited that Pepo is now one of the sponsors for Untold Stories. Even in the few weeks since they launched Pepo at DevCon, not that long ago, I've seen them make so many improvements, like hashtag search based on feedback from people using the app, and so many different features that combine the best parts of what we already love, that parts of Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, but it combines it in a perfect way with such a nice user experience and good security It combines them so perfectly that it looks like, and it actually was built for the crypto community. You can download the app by going to pepo.com forward slash stories, and you can find me there at Charlie Shrem, the same as my Twitter handle. Are you an autodidact? Uh, I don't know if I'd ever 
called myself that. I don't know. Um, I feel like you are. You just described yourself as someone, well, who will figure be able to figure anything else out. However, will are you someone who can learn with some things? With some things, I, I would say yes. I, I I guess you know what? I maybe it is a good term because I did drop out of college, uh, and most of my education has come as an adult teaching myself teaching so. yourself something yeah yeah i guess i guess i would call myself <laughs> i guess that is a good term to use. it's another it's another common denominator in the on people that i've interviewed in the space especially people that kind of uh showed up from 2011 to 2013 is a majority of them are autodidacts but just because there was no one to teach you or explain things to you right. and there's a funny satoshi quote that if you don't understand it i don't have time to explain it to you you know um, and I think that that had a very big impact, that mentality of you need to teach yourself, but not teach yourself, but find the documentation on your own. No one's going to point you in the direction as much as the, the community as, is as friendly as they were. Um, I liked that mentality of saying, welcome to our community. Please don't ask the questions that have been asked before. Use the search tool. You remember like on the the early Bitcoin talk forums, that was a prevalent message. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think it's nice to have people who can help in some ways like that, where there are, yeah, like don't ask, the, don't ask the same questions I've ever been asked when the answer is right there in front of you, essentially. But a lot of times there's just not answers and, and you're going to come to that answer through discussion. And I, I am, I think I'm a bit of a slow learner. Sometimes it just takes me a little bit longer to learn these things, but I'm also really stubborn. So I'm going to stick with these things. Like I'm not just, I don't, I'm not just going to give up. And maybe that's the case with a lot of people. I don't know. But the definition of a professional in my book, at least is someone you can be a professional at anything, but a professional is someone who believes that anything worth doing is worth doing the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would think that's right. And yeah, that's just somebody who probably is stubborn in a lot of ways. <laughs> Except <laughs> a lot of to... people at amateur night at the Apollo would disagree with me. <laughs> they're, I think they're all professionals, but they call themselves amateurs. I mean, yeah. so so what happens next? Well, I mean, I think from there. Uh, How did we hook up? You know, I, I think it was through Eric Voorhees, really, because I think I don't I don't know if he was still living. I think he was still living in New Hampshire at the time. But I'd say by the end of 2012, he would reached out to me. Um, you know, there, we weren't using LinkedIn or whatever for job postings it was just like a facebook dm sure and he's just like hey you want to work a bit instant and i was <laughs> like uh sure <laughs> so what <laughs> what, what did the company and look like to you from your perspective i don't ask this question enough but tell okay. me from your perspective from when eric emailed you do you actually like meeting me the first time what was yeah, that yeah. impression to like coming to work for me at bit instant to, like give us your I perspective vivid, i have a vivid memory of this tell so me. he messaged me and he's like are you interested in working for Bidinsta? And I'm like, sure, that sounds cool. And he's like, all right, I'll set something up with, with Charlie. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going to talk to Charlie, whoever, about a potential job. All right. So I call you on uh, whatever, you know, Skype or whatever it was at the time. And uh, you're like, hey, Magic, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? He's like, yeah, so you're starting, uh, you can start Monday. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, it was just instantly just like, when can you start? We need people. This is this, things are starting to get crazy, and I'm just like, oh, okay, this. Is, I guess we're just not going to talk about like, oh, so what's your past job experience or whatever. It was just like, when can you start? And in hindsight, it's kind of just like, wow, you guys. Like, I feel like I was vouched for in a lot of ways for there to just be this instant. When can you start? Well, Eric so, vouched for you. I knew yeah. you from Porkfest. <clears throat> I did my research. You know, I checked the Google and the Facebook yeah. and stuff, so I figured that out. And you knew you knew a lot about Bitcoin, and that was the most important thing. I had seen that you had come from a. Um, I think Eric told me that that your family was in the in the restaurant business, and that you were mm -hmm. Greek. So I'm like, all right, this guy's a no this guy knows customer service. Um, and then so, what do I need to interview? What am I wasting your time for? Yeah, and I think a lot of the, especially in the early days, it was just reputation, like really helped. Like if you had a, a solid reputation in the community. Or whatever, like I just think that helps you help open a lot of doors because there wasn't, I don't know, there wasn't really who else you can hire at the time. It was just there was hiring no people who else. were into Bitcoin. It's different now. People 
get jobs in the Bitcoin industry and it's just like a normal job for them. You know, they're not they're not Bitcoin fanatics. And that's fine. I don't think everybody needs to be as nuts about it. as I we tweeted are. about this the other day and I said I tweeted about this yesterday, actually. And I didn't I, I use Twitter sometimes to like when I have feelings, I just want to get them off my chest and I'll send them to Twitter. And if people say that they're good or they're stupid, at least it's <laughs> off my chest. But the tweet went something like this. What I miss most about the 2010 to 2013 days is, for better or for worse, the leaders of our fledgling industry were ideological. We were motivated for wanting to change the world. As much as we wanted Bitcoin to grow in value, we knew it may never happen, and that was okay. Did you? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And a lot of us in those early days, it was never. It was never about the money. Like we all had these. Oh, what if Bitcoin goes to the moon? Thoughts, but it, it just didn't seem. Like a real, it wasn't real. It, could, it didn't seem like that could actually happen, and I think when it did, we were probably more surprised than anybody. But like, it was a very ideological <laughs> thing, and it still is. At least for me, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive, but like for me, it still I, it still feels that way. And I think it always. Someone will. would call you up and say, "Hey, do you remember Bitcoin's at fifty dollars?" And did you hear? And I'm like, <laughs> "No fucking way." <laughs> stop, stop pulling my strike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was when I started at BitInstant. You know, I I was. I was working remote and I remember, I remember that run up, like it was that April, early April, 2013 run to like a couple hundred bucks. I was, I spent some time in the, I, I mostly worked remote at the time and it was, it, it was a fun and interesting time for sure. Especially, Describe it. especially with, I, I, it was just, it was new. Like I was dealing with these issues that I've never, I never worked customer service email in the Bitcoin industry. And I mean, who at the time had that experience? So we were, a lot of us were just figuring out as we went. And I, I think for the most part, BitInstant worked. A lot of the hangups, a lot of the problems people had with getting money, oftentimes, you know, with getting their Bitcoin, oftentimes dealt with, because we were dealing with Mt. Gox. We were dealing with BTCE. We were dealing with a lot of these exchanges that just aren't around anymore. And uh, a lot of the hangups were usually with Gox. You know, I, I don't want to just throw them under the bus for everything, but I think it's pretty valid to say. A lot yeah, of things. I think everyone knew that. Of course, the system wasn't perfect. Like the whatever you know, the back end for Bit Instant it was put together with with paper clips right. and and scotch tape. But at the same time, the only where the only place to source large amounts of Bitcoin in real time was through Mount Gox. And Mount Gox would do things like we'd send them a wire transfer, and they just Mark would be sleeping for three days. Yeah, I mean, and I'd literally have to like call him up. I, I remember when a time I was I did spend at, at the office in New York uh, where. You were literally booking flights to Japan to, <laughs> to go and be like, "Oh, I remember that." What the hell? And it was, we had <laughs> it was like last minute. We had thousands of Bitcoin. Yeah, we had thousands of Bitcoin that were that were that were people were waiting on, and we had wired the money to Mount Gox, and all of our customers are coming to us. We had thousands of Bitcoin that were due to customers, and I mean, Bitcoin was worth dollars at the time, right. probably, and and Mark was single-handedly the person who was responsible for crediting your dollars on the exchange so then we could buy Bitcoin and send it to our customers. And he just wouldn't answer his phone. So I called Roger and I was like, Roger, you got to go over there. Go to his house. <laughs> oh, and Roger, Roger went over there. In Japan, yeah. Yeah, he, lived, he used to live down the block from Mark. And Roger went over there and Mark just did not answer the door. Um, and he was not at the office. Mark, Roger went to the office for me, went to his house. Mark cannot be found. And I was like, I'm fucking getting on a plane. And I was literally this close to booking a ticket. I think I actually did book a ticket, but then I, I canceled it because eventually Mark just showed up on IRC, which he would do. Doesn't answer the text, doesn't answer the calls. Mark would just show up on the IRC and he'd say, what's wrong? What's up? It's like, Mark, credit <laughs> right fucking now. I still have some of those chats. I saved the IRC chats. And if you read them, he'd say, how was this guy CEO of an industry? But him and I are on pretty cordial terms now. And he he knows that the way he ran the company was just insane back then. It, it's so surreal when you think about it, especially just using BitInstant. For people who don't know, it's like you had to go into like a drugstore. You'd pick up the red uh, MoneyGram phone and you'd have to do, you'd have this sheet that you'd have from like uh, through this process. I think you guys use like ZipZap at the time, which was... Sure. <laughs> it was just... Or just, Trust Cash or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it was just so weird. Like you have to go into a drugstore and you pick and you're using this like antiquated system to get but tell me nowadays money. tell me now at this moment of time how can you get bitcoin that fast that cheap you st there's still like you go to coinbase and so you got kind of bank accounts you got to do all this stuff with bit instant you just go to the website you print a slip out you go to the store down the road of walgreens or a cvs or a walmart 
and you got your Bitcoin in 20 minutes. It, you don't need to enter in all this like banking information. You don't need to give banking information and social security numbers and all this stuff yeah, unf- just to get Bitcoin. Unfortunately, the KYC issue is, you know, it's, that's the thing now, right? With buying Bitcoin. I guess unless you're buying small, but it goes more than that. Like basic KYC is okay, but instant we took people's IDs and you have to show your ID at like the CVS. I think the 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 it goes so above and beyond because they have to worry about fraud too, and that's where the issue is. Like KYC is okay, but when you're you're dealing with fraud, you got to connect your whole life now, like all your banking details and prove it. And it's just I don't know. I, I kind of miss those days, but at the same time. That instance legacy was what it was. It did its job. And there are now a lot better companies that make it make right. it easier to buy and sell Bitcoin. And that was okay. When BitInstant worked, it worked. Like, no doubt. It worked great at the time. Uh, I mean, I'm no fan of KYC. I'm not going to say I'm a fan of it at all. Uh, I understand what you've been through. It's a little different. Uh, sure. But no joke. Um, I think we should be, we should get some credit for being one of the only Bitcoin companies that shut down that actually returned everyone's money. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for the most part, I think in the end, things, maybe a couple of people, I, I don't know, like, if, if 100% of the issues were resolved, because I know by the by then, by like the summer of 2013, you were pretty much letting everybody go. Uh, and That was really hard on me. Oh, and, I'm, and I know it was, and it's like, I wasn't mad or anything. I was like, hey, man, thanks for the opportunity. This was awesome. Uh, you know, it was scary for me just starting a job like that, because I'd never worked at a startup, and I'm in my, at the time, I was in like my mid thirties, you know, I had worked pretty much like a crap job through my twenties and it was just like a complete life change point for me. Like I just, the the year I got into Bitcoin, I switched, you know, from eating crap food to low carb and lost like 50 some pounds. I went through a divorce. I moved to New Hampshire. I got into Bitcoin. It was just like the most insane year. And then like, I'm doing all these things that it's just, I never really thought I'd be involved with or just couldn't even imagine, but it's just, I'm just running with it, you know, just and doing it. So for like, even though I was only with BitInstant for, I guess, a relative short time, it was just, it was a really cool opportunity and it was really fun. And I think it kind of like set the stage for my next jump in the customer service industry. You were one of our, you were one of our oldest employees and longest employees, I think. Team members. It's probably the oldest in age. I don't know. It was a lot of yeah. <laughs> what was it like working when you used to come to the office in New York? What was it like working in in the Bidinson office in like 2012, 2013? Uh, it was it was nutty, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. That's a good way to describe. And it. you had I remember when you got your uh, the, one of the early the first ASIC miners from uh, yes from uh, Yufi uh, Yufu Yufu yeah sorry what's his last name? I, Guo yeah yeah. I, and I remember he had one of the very first, the Avalon miners, right? Is that what they were? We turned it off because it was too hot, but it was mining like 30 Bitcoin a day. Well, you left it on when I was in the office and I sat right yeah. next to it. And I just remember how hot that thing would get. But man, I bet it was making some good bank at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was making good bank, but Bitcoin wasn't worth much. It was probably making like a hundred bucks a day or 50 bucks a day at the time. I remember um, at this point, Bitcoin was only being mined on graphics cards and Yifu who was this like nomad who literally would just show up at the office and work out of Bit Instant office and no one knew what he did. He was just the Bit Instant office was the like like the Bitcoin center because if you if you were interested in Bitcoin or you were you wanted to see what was going on or talk to some people, you would just show up at the office. That's true. So people would this- just show up. That's a good point. People would show up from other big like Trade Hill or whatever. People would just show up and I'm like, oh, who and are work you? And hang out. And they're like, well, who are you? And I'm like, <laughs> Do you work for this company? They're like, no, I work for something completely unrelated to BitInstant, but in the Bitcoin industry. And I'm like, oh, cool. Nice to meet you. And I've I made friends through working there who didn't even work for BitInstant that I still talk to today. <laughs> we had a, we had a complete open door policy. And for a financial services company, it was like, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. But I just yeah. I wanted I wanted to attract all Bitcoin people. I wanted everyone to come. I wanted to introduce people. I wanted to meet. I wanted to grow this community so badly. And we had this amazing open door policy. Um, and I and I loved it. And so um It was neat. I I, I did like I liked that a lot about it. And I think it kind of gave that like uh as my first experience with a startup, it was a really it was probably the most fun at, for the time. I mean it was crazy, but like that's in a in a fun way. Of course it was stressful at times, especially when of course everything when the is. bubble popped in April, you know, and it dropped from two sixty to you know sixty bucks or whatever. It, it was a crazy bubble. It was it was crazy. It was stressful for me, 
No, and and I think this is actually what helped me do so well in bear markets. It helped me like not freak out over the price. Is I'm dealing with customer issues and I'm dealing with you know trying to help people and it and it gets crazy. But then when the bear market hits, things kind of just like chew out a little bit, and it almost you you learn to just like that. You, like you learn to enjoy the bear markets more because it gives you time to just like recharge and work on other projects that need caught up with. Uh, I think this was one of my favorite bear markets that we just went through. Um, oh, yeah. I really enjoyed it because I knew Bitcoin was going to come back. Where in the other ones, you you had this little fear in your mind whether Bitcoin was actually going to come back or not, right? Uh, I, I think for me, like I said, with bear market, yeah, I, I think in the earlier ones for sure, you think like, oh gosh, is Bitcoin really dead uh, or something? You know, especially your first bear market, you can feel like that. Sure, but so when you've been in so it, you, so long, um, it feels less like that for sure. So you have this, there was this, uh, just to finish the story from earlier, you had this guy Yifu and he, you know, some people would show up, hang out for a day or two and then leave and go do, do their own thing. Yifu would show up in the morning as if he was an employee, sit not in the bit instant office. He would sit on my office, he sit in your on office my door. couch, yep. <laughs> in my office every day well, on his laptop. Like weeks go by and he's a nice kid. He'd bring bottles of rum. He'd buy me lunch. I'm saying to myself, I like this guy. But what the hell does he do? Who is he? <laughs> no idea who he's sitting on my couch every single day. He's friends with everyone. Everyone likes him. And I'm thinking he's just like a like a hanger on, like a straggler or a freeloader, or whatever. Next thing I know, right? And don't forget, so so Bitcoin is being mined on graphics cards. Let's just say graphic cards were mining. Let's just say one NVIDIA graphics card was mining five Bitcoin a day. Let's just use that as the as the standard, for example. Five Bitcoin a day per graphics card. You have 10 graphics cards. You're mining 50 Bitcoin a day. 99.9% of all Bitcoin is being done on these graphics cards. The only ones who are not are mining like Satoshi did on their MacBooks or Windows, which weren't getting you much. Right. So everyone's mining on graphics cards. One morning, Yifu calls me up and he says, Charlie, I need you to come pick me up. I need your car. I was like, all right, this guy doesn't have a car. So I pick him up in my car and I'm like, where are we going? <clears throat> So he's like, drive to JFK. I'm like, all right, maybe I'm dropping him off at the airport. We drive to JFK and we go to the um, freight area of the airport, of John F. Kennedy Airport. We go to the freight. Yifu goes inside, 30 minutes. He comes back and he has this big fucking, it looks like, it looks like a monster version of the old like towers he used to have. Like when you buy a computer like a Dell, it would, you'd have like the monitor and you'd have the tower. It looked just like a, a tower that was double the size but the sides were missing and it wasn't in a box or anything. It was just this, this tower. Yeah. It was like a, a, big it was like a full ATX case. It was huge. Yeah. And so he, he, he put it in my trunk and we brought it over to the office and I'm like, Yifu, what the hell is this thing? He goes, this is going to mine Bitcoin better. And I was like, okay. And at that point myself and almost no one had heard of ASICs, application specific integrated circuit machines. And now these machines are what 99% of what people we're mine are mining today. In fact, almost a hundred percent of all Bitcoin mining is probably happening on ASICs. So Yifu plugs this in, and now this thing is mining like instead of five Bitcoin an, a day, it's mining like 30 Bitcoin a day. And this all happened from this kid who used to hang out at our office at Bit Instant in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it it, it was uh wh what a thing, right? Like to, to He fundamentally changed mining forever. Yeah. Fundamentally changed mining forever. And I think I, I think it, pretty much everyone involved with mining in those days who was selling hardware, I think I, I don't think it ended too well as far as like from the customer aspect. I think a lot of people, I'm still waiting for my butterfly labs. Yeah, I think a lot of people got screwed over with stuff and it's unfortunate. We had um, Elena Vranova on the show from from Trezor and, and I told her the story of how you actually got me into Trezor. But she <laughs> she's still waiting on her butterfly labs refund. Oh, too. no. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 rough. I mean, Butterfly Labs that was obviously one of the worst of the worst. But but yeah, uh, I just remember sitting next to that thing and it was so hot, it was so hot. And that was just one. And now that thing, you know, it, it, you couldn't you couldn't make any money off of that. Obviously, it's just a relic. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'd mentioned how in the summer you were letting people go. Summer of 2013, you started letting folks go, just pretty much winding things down. Uh, with Bit Instant, and what happened next? And from there, I was just, I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to figure something else out now. And I spent a couple of weeks. I was still in New Hampshire at the time. I was getting ready to 
to move. But uh, I remember I got a message from Roger Veer, who Roger Veer, I know that like people hear that name now and there's just a lot of just anger and whatever, depending on what side of Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or whatever you're on. Uh, but like at the time, I mean, he he was like the Bitcoin guy, right? Like he really was. It's that's just like that could be like a whole other podcast. But he reached out to me and he was like, "Hey, uh, I need somebody to help with tickets with uh, Blockchain Info. We would just be working a couple hours a week. Uh, are you interested? You know, Charlie. I'd reached out to Charlie and asked him looking for somebody. And yeah, I, I recommended you. Um, I really felt bad having to let go of people, but as the company grew and the regulations come out in 2013 that you need money transmitter licenses yeah. and the amount of money that it would cost. And then the fact that we had to send back um, money to the investors, um, we just never, we just decided to not continue running the company and to, to shut it down and give everyone's money back. And the hardest part was having to let people go. The good news is that I was able to, to replace a lot of people, not replace to, to help place a lot of our team members at other places so like alex waters and all and the, that crew went and did and did something with matthew mellon and then roger called me up and said do you know anyone who'd be good and i said you got to call mandrick 1000 percent the best best team member we have and so um i was really happy when he had called you well he didn't call and, me it was once again it was a facebook message this is how i've got all my jobs in bitcoin yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not on, I'm not on facebook anymore which explains why i don't have a job right now i guess it's <laughs> 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 but yeah he messages me on facebook uh, and again, it was one of these, hey, are you interested? And I said, yeah, we could talk about it. And then it's just how many employees were forward. at blockchain at the time? Uh, there were really there weren't any. OK, uh, it was just pretty much Ben Reeves at the time, the creator. Uh, and then I guess Roger at first was helping with tickets. But there's a whole thing with that on Bitcoin talk where I, I don't know. There were, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really want to go into that too much, but <laughs> it's just a lot of the drama. Involved, but basically, they there wasn't really anybody doing tickets. It was just kind of like Ben Reeves is running the site. He's got all these things going. He's got all these balls in the air, and he doesn't really have time to respond to customers or to users. I guess they weren't customers. Uh, and I said, sure. So it was again. It was another one of these things. Like, okay, can you start like tomorrow? And I'm like, uh, okay, sure, let's do it. I don't care. Let's just dive right in. What, what are we waiting for? So I feel like you never have job interviews. People just hire you. <laughs> Sight on scene. I've literally never had a legit job interview in my life, uh, which is just crazy because it was either working for my family and then I worked for a cable company for a while, which my friend basically got me in there. It wasn't a real job interview. And then it was working for myself and then <laughs> been instant in blockchain. So it's like I've never I've never gone through the real process of a job in my life and I'm almost 40, uh, which is kind of cool. So <laughs> so I just, yeah. You're we, almost 40? Really? Yeah, yeah. I thought you were my age. <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> I'm turning 30. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that carnivore keto diet's working for Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it is. But uh, yeah, so so uh, he just introduced me to like the system, gave me a basic rundown, and then he's like, have at it. And I look at the ticket queue, and there's just 10,000 in there or something from like a year plus old that are just unanswered. And I'm just like, holy shit. <laughs> did you go and answer those? Or did you just like mark them all as red and moved on? I, I essentially re did like a mass reply. I, I picked a date up to like the pat like anything older than like twenty days, and I mass replied to all those. And I was like, "Hey, sorry, we never responded to you. We're closing this issue out. If you're still having a problem, just open a new one." Because there was no oh, way. That's a good like a mass response. Yeah, yeah. There's like there's no way I'm going through all these. I'm just gonna. I, I bet. I bet you know ninety percent of them are resolved. If there's still an issue, they'll they'll definitely get back to me. So that's what I did. Because it's you have to pick a point. Like there's no. I didn't have a team of people to help me with go through this. It's just me working out of my house. Can I tell you a funny story? Yeah, go ahead. I don't want you to. I don't want you to 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 forget your place of thought because I want to hear the rest of this. But I there's a story that you you just reminded me of. So when I. When I got out of when I got out of prison, um, you were actually one of the first people to know that I got out of prison. Yeah. Because I didn't even turn on my cell phone or my um, I didn't turn on a cell phone. I didn't turn on a computer. No one knew. We just happened to be living in the same super small village in Pennsylvania together. Yeah, at the um, time, yeah. Town. And so, so I got out, and I'm like, I wake up one morning, and I'm like, all right, today's the day. Today's the day. I'm gonna open up my Gmail and let the world know that I'm out. So I opened up my laptop. And I opened up my Gmail and I see like 
12,300 unread messages. <laughs> and these are not spam. These are the ones that Google Gmail identifies as like important and unread. So, you know, like people I've communicated with before. So like they actually are all requiring some response or something. I literally go through like, so I decide instead of starting from like the first day I was in jail, I started from like the, the day that was, and then I went back and I literally wrote like three emails and I was like, fuck this, man. <laughs> and I literally click like Mark all is red. And I'm like, if people are emailing me and don't know that I'm in jail for the past year, then they're not worth responding to. Yeah, I mean, at some point, they, you think they would have figured it out, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> like, where's Charlie? <laughs> I, but while I was in there, my bank had actually went out of business, too. So it was pretty funny. I, I was like bank accountless. We talked a lot while you were in prison. I remember. We did. We, we, we emailed did. We, all the time. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I needed that for my sanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it's like, that's kind of how I felt like when I got in there and I'm like, I, I don't know, you know where to even begin with this. So I just kind of picked, like I said, I just picked a time. Uh, I'll start at this point. And that's what I did. And it just turned into, I had all these issues. I, I never realized how much I didn't know about Bitcoin until I started working for blockchain.info. I, I feel, I felt like, because working for BitInstant was different. It was like a closed system. You're dealing with specific things related to BitInstant. You're not necessarily dealing with nuances of bitcoin you know the more technical stuff it's just like hey where's my bitcoin i put in this order and you pull up the order and do all that this was more vague open bitcoin stuff you know because blockchain dynamo at the time had the non-custodial web wallet and they had the block explorer and people just the questions i would get were anything from just super basic to i have no idea and i have to now spend two hours reading about this so that job was really the most hands-on learning I've ever had. And that working, working that position really just taught me so much about Bitcoin at the time. Because who could I go to? I could go to Ben. Well, Ben's doing a million things. Uh, and shortly after I joined, uh, Nick Carey joined blockchain, that info. And then my wife joined a couple months later, which was really cool. Being able to work with her in our home together, you know, like for the same company. And she was doing more like social media stuff. So it was just a lot of just, I have to figure it out myself. No one was really going to teach me. And that was hard, but I liked it because it's just like, I wanted to be involved in Bitcoin 24 seven as it was. So it was just a way, it was like I was getting paid to learn. It was almost like- a, And how did, that, how did that company grow over time? Uh, I think it grew, it, 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 the team definitely grew. I mean, they started to raise money over the years. Um, when when Peter Smith joined, and I think that was a lot more, it came a lot more like he had more of like a corporate direction for it. And, you know, I think the focus, the focus changed a lot. When you, when you join a company really early, it is about, I think there's a lot more idealistic viewpoints and people joining super early on are going to be more idealistic. Uh, but maybe that's not necessarily those ideas aren't don't necessarily make money that's a good point um not always anyway i mean that's that doesn't have to always be the case but it's probably a lot harder and the bigger you grow um uh, as you know the more eyes you have on you with regulation things like that true uh it's easy to be under the radar when you're small the company has like hundreds of employees now it's one of the largest companies in the world i mean you had yeah. the prime minister of england at your ribbon cutting event yeah, and I mean, things like that, like, th there's a lot of things, as the company aged, it, it got a lot harder for me, because a lot of the, the direction it was heading in, it's not a direction, it's not like, this isn't why I got into Bitcoin, I don't, I'm not interested in, you know, working with law enforcement to, uh, to, to just do like, you feel to do KYC, or to do KYC, or to do like, uh, I see your point, I see your point, and I have to commend you for actually sticking with it, because... As long as you did, because a lot of people got burnt out. Um, you know, our good friend, Jared Kenna, we had him on one of our first episodes. Right. And he never went back to doing anything after Trade Hill in 2014, 2013, just because the he felt the community had changed too much back then. And and it did change. I, but that It did. But that's not a bad thing. People, people no. associate that. Sometimes people just... They want things to stay the way they were. And I think we've seen a lot of that with like the fork of Bitcoin, you know, with, with Bcash and all that. Like 
It's like every politician where I live now, they all want it to stay the same yeah. in the city. And you just can't expect that from Bitcoin. You just, you, you just that's what I've learned. Like it, things are going to change. And sometimes I, I don't know, like I, has it, has it been for the best? I, I think so. I think the way the direction is where Bitcoin is now, I think is incredible. Um, Mandrick, is there a place for guys like, and girls like us in today's Bitcoin? Or are we just happy to be sitting with our Bitcoins on the side and watching from a distance? Uh, it depends what you want to do. Really? I launched the show. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. Like you've, you've changed course, right? Like, and, <laughs> and what you're doing and that's, and that's fine. I think there's always a place. Uh, if you want Bitcoin to be what you think it should be, and you're gonna Satoshi's scream, vision, yeah, and you're gonna scream from the mountaintop, "This is what Bitcoin was supposed to be," and you guys are ruining it. You're probably gonna have a bad time. And you know that's not me. Like that's not really how I felt about it. I've kind of I've evolved as Bitcoin has evolved as well, and I think it's fine. Like yeah, I came into this as a merchant, and I saw it as this fast, free, anonymous way to accept money for selling food and stuff. And, you know, I look back on that and I'm like, okay, didn't work out like that. And that's fine. Like, that's not. Because- but if you look at yourself from, from who you were back then to who you are now, I feel like Bitcoin helped us become these better, more mature adults. You know, like we, we, will we be who we are today if not, if not for Bitcoin? It's absolutely. I absolutely, I, I agree with that. And, and I can see, and when I look back and I evaluate how I've changed, I can see what that time when that moment when I went from I want to use Bitcoin for every transaction to maybe I should you know maybe I should hodl maybe it's more important to I I see the value of it like that that where the store of value really started to take over and it and it wasn't about because I it wasn't like the it wasn't I wasn't doing that because I'm like oh I can make more money if I do this it just made more sense to me to just I, I saw the value in holding. Uh, and I still use Bitcoin. I still make purchases with it. I, I, but I don't know. Tell me some crazy stories of of what happened during uh, blockchain.info, like some crazy customer support stories. Uh, I, I mean, there was times where people just lost lost access to their wallets, and I had to help them find. Basically, it's like trying to find a vault inside a a giant facility filled with vaults. <laughs> And, you know, people just like, oh, I had this wallet that had like hundreds of, you know, five, 600 Bitcoin in it. And at the time, Bitcoin's like 150 bucks or maybe 400 bucks or something like that. And just helping people with that. I, I learned firsthand working at blockchain.info that the Bitcoin community is the most generous, can be some of the most generous people as far as like people would want to tip you. And I'm just like, oh, I get paid. It's fine. But they would insist <laughs> and they would send you these tips. And you're just like, yeah, dude, you just gave me like a month's salary. You know, like this is insane. This didn't take me that long. Like, I don't think it's worth it. So it, it was kind of mind blowing seeing things like that. And it happened more than you would think. Uh, and a lot of times I ask you, oh, I was just going to say a lot of times, like when I'd get those tips, I would actually just like pay it forward in other ways, like the Dory Nakamoto thing. I remember there was a fundraiser for that. And there was times oh, where yeah. I was just like, I'm going to empty my tip jar for this, you know, like. I think that is just just use it to help others. Blockchain.info is a company that had started long before anyone had ever heard about Bitcoin by Ben Reeves, I think like 2010, maybe. Yeah. It wasn't even a company, it was just an explorer. Um, and eventually it became a company. It was a way to like track you, double spends early on. Sure. Like super early you, on. You, you joined the company, there were some employees, and the company kept growing with, with the original vision of being this libertarian type of company. But then nowadays, blockchain.info, and, I, and I'm not putting it down or putting it up. I, I'm just pointing out what it is. And um, blockchain.info, blockchain.com nowadays right. um, is kind of known as one of the, those companies that change the most rapidly. Um, you know, like you said, working with like law enforcement and, and um, just KYC. doing different things in terms of like its wallets and things like that. Altcoin support. Yeah. And I think that altcoin support, yeah, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoinism went away. What I'm trying to figure out is like, at what point did that happen and why? Because that is a, is a perfect comparison to when the, the Bitcoin community as a whole changed. Mm-hmm. 
I think it followed like perfectly in perfect correlation. So from being inside blockchain.info, what changed and why did it change? For me, I, I think I saw the change. A lot of people outside would probably have seen it later. But like for me, internally, I think I really started to see that change when they started getting rid of the mixing services. So blockchain.info used to have a coin join implementation. Now it's this, this coin join implementation that they had is nowhere near, nowhere near as good as like, say like Wasabi Wallet today. Uh, sure, like but they had market. something. But they had something, okay. And they just, it was having some issues. And I remember they shut it down like, oh, it's just temporary. It's just temporary. And that's what they kept telling me. And, I'm, and they're like, no, we're working on this other solution. We're going to have this other mixer. It's going to be great. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I come into work one day or whatever on my computer and I just see it's gone. And I'm just like, what happened? And you know, nobody would talk to me about it because they knew, they knew how I felt about it and nobody wanted to talk to me. <laughs> so I think a lot of ways, like, like the company was changing, like they're just like, oh, we can't do mixers. We're going to get in trouble. You know, like these are. You Were know. you one of the last of the Mohegans? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it kind of felt like that. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't it know. does. I don't know. Like when I. I, when I saw that, like there was just these little incremental things. I mean, that was a big one, but there were other incremental things where the company grew and became more and more corporate. And I'm, yeah, I'm idealistic, but I'm also, I also have like that rational side where like I have these views, like I consider myself an ANCAP, but I also think a lot of it is just, it's just fantasy. Like the, the, the actuality of that happening in my lifetime is just fantasy, but it doesn't mean I still can't have these beliefs and try to live my life, you know, in a way that, is as close to represents that as possible, but so what's next for you? I have no idea, man. I've just been <laughs> since I le- I left blockchain in like early 2018. I think I think the fork, the 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 blockchain Bitcoin the, Cash Bitcoin Fork, Cash, Cash Fork, yeah, like the, and then blockchain moving to support more and more altcoins. I was done. Like I have no interest in offering and and putting my time into those things and like helping users with that. It's just not something I care about. So. I, I why why hasn't blockchain.info implemented SegWit yet? Uh I don't know. I don't I, I have no idea on it really. But you realize it's a problem, right? Like there's no reason for them to it's still one of the largest wallets. And the fact that they're not trans, uh, you know, having support for a SegWit on Bitcoin is what's causing like a lot of these blocks to be full and fees to go up. I think the CEO of Peter Smith was on he was on a podcast recently where he said it's something that they're working on, but their users We're going for two years. Their users aren't demanding it right now. Come on. Um, in my time there, he never answered a ticket, so I don't know. Maybe now he's been talking to users. I, I have no idea, and I'm sure users aren't users weren't necessarily asking. Hey, when Segwit? You know, back in back when it first came out. But they. Were but it's one of those things that the users, volume. the users don't un, the, the users see a problem, but they don't understand what the solution is, and it's I feel like it's up to the company to implement solutions that would allow them to. To 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 do a better job, so you don't have to deal with tickets of why is it so slow. Right, and 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 the reality is, like all of us on Bitcoin Twitter, listen, people listening to this podcast and stuff, it's such the tiny majority of Bitcoin users. The people I, were, I was helping and those tickets, they don't read Reddit. They don't. They're not on Twitter. They're not even, for the most part, in America. Like they're they're just spread out everywhere. It's insane. really it's such a huge amount of people. I've prob- I've personally answered probably over a hundred thousand blockchain dot info tickets. Like. In my time there, I've spent four and a half years at the company answering tickets. And I mean, it got to the point where I had, we had to hire somebody who was fluent in Russian to help with all the Russian support tickets we were getting. Uh, it's insane. Like, there's so many people. And they don't, they don't care about SegWit. They don't care about any of the drama. They're, they don't care about SegWit, but they care about the fact that blocks are full and fees are high and it's slow. And that's the responsibility of the company to, <laughs> to implement those things, right? Uh, you know why it hasn't been implemented? I, I don't know. I don't really follow what they're doing anymore at this point. Uh, I think the reality is, where where have all the big companies who have money, who have been making money, what have they been doing? They're making it on like exchange fees, right? Like you look at like Binance and any other of the big exchanges. It's altcoin support. It's those trade fees. It doesn't matter if if uh, if if the coins are useful or not. It's just like if people are doing exchanges, they're getting their cut. That's all it comes down to, right? Like you're running a business. That's how, that's how you make money, I guess, in this space. Can you really, True story. Can you really make money just as a Bitcoin-only website anymore? 
if you're not selling like hardware or I, I don't and there's some cool hardware nowadays out there. Oh yeah, I have a lot of it. I I love uh, I love a lot of. This I have stuff. so many. <laughs> they, I li- so I have literally on my desk at home. I have the Trezor, the Ledger. I have a Jupiter Wallet. I have a BC Vault. I have a Keep Key, and they're almost all still in pack. I have multiples of like all of them, and I don't even know. Like I like. So have you tried the Jupiter one? It's like a card. No, it's I super cool. It's like the original Bitcoin card. I just got a test Bitbox, uh, a beta one, and I was testing that, and that's really cool. That's that's still in beta. I heard that Trezor is actually mailing, um, Trezor mailed a like Chrome thousand dollar version of its Trezor to Peter McCormick. He was at my house. He showed it to me this weekend. The the, ten, the five year anniversary one. Yeah, I think it's like super metal and stuff I have like that. It in my hand right now. They how is it like? How do I get one? They sent me one because my. I, I originally went, they did a fundraiser through Kickstarter and I got the yeah. OG metal one through that and it broke. It just stopped working. So they sent me the five year anniversary one for free and which was really cool of them. I didn't, I wasn't like, Hey guys, this broke. Give me something. They were just like, Hey, sorry about that. We'll send you one of the, uh, the metal five year anniversary ones. I don't know. Hit them up. Maybe they can hook you up. <laughs> I will. Trezor, if you're listening to this, <laughs> get me one of your Trezors. Well, Magic, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot, Charlie. It's good talking to you as always. You too. I'll talk to you later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories are released every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. EST on untoldstories.com, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Untold Stories is produced by Jason Yanowitz, Michael E. Polito, Reed Hannaford, and Riley Silbert of Blockworks Group. Our account executives are Gina D. Felice and Julie Muroff. Our content is written by Kathy Zolo, Ronnie Tishner, and Scott Offord. Special thanks to Wayne Dallaire from Jump Dog Audio Productions. And of course, I'm your host, Charlie Shrem. You can follow me on Twitter, at Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation Send me some messages, feedback, or anything you want to say. And remember, please give some love to my sponsors, and I'll see you next week. Remember, strength in numbers and information is power.